Okay, welcome everybody. Steve Burns here, Digital Creativity with Stephen Burns, and today is our light wave roundtable discussion. So here's here's the here's the deal. It's not a formal presentation, right? You don't have to have anything organized and prepared to present to a group. You just jump on and say, hey, this is some cool stuff I've been doing. If you want to show images, I have to give you a pass. So you know, let me know if you want me want to show me the images. Um, you can, you can, I can, I, I can get a link to what you want me to look at. I can share it with the group. Um, anybody wants to jump on board? I just placed the link um, in the chat box. I'm going to do it again right now. So anybody would like to share? You have to have a USB headset, okay? All right, so that's important. So I think most everybody have that already. If you have, if you have a laptop, it's already built in. Um, so I'm, I'm typing in the link to the Adobe Connect room. And as soon as I see you come into the Adobe Connect room, um, I will um, I will you know give you presenters' rights, which allow which will allow you to use your microphone so everybody can hear and see you. All right, so um, I right, and and anybody comes on, anything can happen today. When we have our our, our Lightwave Users Group meeting, which is always the first Sunday um, of every month, about normally about 10 a.m. With the exception that I'm teaching a light wave class, a five week light wave class right now, so I may push it to 1 p.m. from time to time, but it's always going to be on that uh, Sunday. So uh, make sure on Nightbox you're going to see a link come up to join the light wave users group meeting. All right, um, or join the light wave users group in in general. Join that because that's where you're going to be notified of our our monthly meetings updates on anything going on, special new tech um, or, or light waves um, you know, presentations. And we have um, Liberty 3D, which uh, I'm, I'm actually one of their authors as well. Um, they're going to have updates on deals for their stuff, so I will be sending out updates on their product as well. This, and and Kelly, um, Kelly, who has the presenter currently, you can see his logo back there, Liberty 3D. He is the owner of Liberty 3D. It's, a, it's an educational a content educational site for 3D and, and a variety of programs in there. Um, yeah. So I am and I, I I am current I am currently working on a title for him. I've been so swamped with school. S semester just ended three weeks ago, so now I can focus on this other stuff and getting more content out to Kelly. So guys, be patient. I'm I've, I've got it coming up, and thank you, Kelly, for being patient with me. I really appreciate oh, no it. Problem. No problem. It's been extremely. Um, uh, busy last six weeks. Um, there's been quite a bit of activity, so uh, no worries. Okay, cool. Um, and hopefully, the activity means more money in your pocket too, because we all, we uh, God knows, we all, all of us are artists needed. <laughs> well, stra strangely enough, um, actually, um, work has finally slowed down enough for me to do a couple of side things. So, um, uh, one of those things uh, I have been waiting for for some time, and I've finally been um, given something to play with. Um, and what I'm going to show, uh, I really should, um, you know, be very cautious about this, but, um, this is something literally that I literally just downloaded and installed, uh, from the author of it, uh, just a couple of nights ago and I have a house guest, so it's been a little bit chaotic and all last week I was also writing a short film script, um, called The Exchange and The Exchange is going to have some lightweight visual effects in it and, um, it's going to be, uh, uh, directed and produced by a pair of, uh, brothers here uh, in Las Vegas, they also work out of Georgia. Um, one of them is camera operator in Game of Thrones, um, very skilled guys, they had a documentary come out recently called Girl, uh, The Beauty is the Beast, um, you should check that out if you can, it's on Amazon. So um, they're going to uh, direct this thing, they're going to produce it, so um, that's pretty much a done deal. It's going to have a budget of a oh, whopping $3,000, but um, actually that's uh, not bad considering what this thing is about. So that's been all last week, and um, obviously it's... Uh, you know, holiday season for people, so I have a house guest down from Calgary, and I'm taking care of my friend Sandy's dog while she's over the tour. <laughs> so it's been, it's been crazy. Well, I know you're gonna that's be. That, uh, what is that thing that you said uh, on, on Facebook the other day? So that, that's why. That? Yeah, you're gonna be very, very happy to get rid of that dog, aren't you? Because <laughs> you're a cat no. man. <laughs> well, Tini's a, a cat dog. His uh, name is actually oh. Martini, but um, it's uh, a jack rat, so it's quite smart. Um, and she literally just sits here and sleeps all the time. But she's super hyperactive when she's awake. Um, so you got to be you know on top of it. And uh, she has a thing for plastic bags, which aren't good because they you know, breathe them in. Uh, uh, they sound like Darth Vader. So, 
It's all good. Um, uh, anyway, the um, uh, fun thing that we're going to show today, okay, and I really wish um, uh, Joe was uh, on board with the, us today because uh, this would be a good time, but what we're going to do here is I'm going to get people who want to get in on beta testing this because um, this has been a long time coming. The original concepts for this go back at least 10 years. Um, and finally, uh, uh, wonderful Joe Justice has been able to do this. And we're going to talk about LightNet. This is the new LightNet. And this new LightNet is uh, a little bit different than anything that um, has come before it. Um, and uh, this was being done as um, codenamed Skynet. And Skynet, uh, as we all know from the magical Terminator films, is the <laughs> evil computer that uh, uh, launches a nuclear conflict to destroy its enemies or try to play it. But um, the concept behind Skynet um, was originally from uh, myself and uh, Timothy Alvey working in 2008 on a couple of sci-fi um, network television shows that um, required us to be able to do remote rendering. Um, and unfortunately, we couldn't get our solution to work, but it was very, very close. And uh, we also had pizza just to take a stab at this, um, working with us via uh, Dropbox and um, L-Scripts. Um, the intention was to be able to use Dropbox to read and write ACK and command files for ScreamerNet uh, over Dropbox, and then you'd be able to launch um, ScreamerNet um, versions looking in that same folder along with the content directory for your LightWave project and be able to render over Dropbox and save the images to a Dropbox folder or over to an FTP. Now what we've kind of done here, what Joe's done, is he's reversed this process and he's using FTP to communicate for um, LightNet uh, transactions and ScreamerNet launches and queue management through FTP. Now this version right here is literally the first beta that I've been given. This is the second time I've literally launched it, so I'm just going to go through some of the windows here so people get an idea what this is about. It's going to feel very similar to some people. Um, your LightNet settings, okay, and you give your render folder a render name, okay, you can have groups. And our intention is eventually to, um, any of you guys familiar with uh, Winamp and Showcast? No, probably not. Okay, well, anyway, um, many, 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 many years ago, um, in between my kind of vacation from visual effects, I was doing a lot of streaming media technology, and um, what we were doing was um, trying to get a uh, video streaming technology to work very much like Shoutcast, and um, there's actually a business plan in my uh, closet in the back here with all the rest of my papers uh, for a company that I had called Kixpix, and Kixpix um, was almost sold to AOL Melsoft at one point, and then we almost sold it again to another company out in Australia for $6.5 million. Unfortunately, that went sideways. Now, the point of that was is that um, uh, it would be able to use um, various streaming technologies and protocols to uh, produce literally conventional television concepts over the net. So instantaneous channel streaming, um, no grid buffering, instantaneous channel changing, uh, multiple language channels, uh, different angles if you wanted. Um, one of the strange applications for it immediately that we got uh, from a company out of uh, Vancouver called Starnet was um, they wanted to use it for porn. <laughs> so it's like, okay, well, um, they're always on the cusp of all that stuff. But the uh, point is, is that um, the intention of this is completely, you know, specification subject to change type area is that um, we want to make this so that uh, we can have lists of render groups online that are participating in the Skynet network. And that will allow for you, me, anybody, everybody to participate in doing renders via FTP using Skynet. And my internal network of 10 machines could contribute to your two machines and somebody else could jump in and they can have five machines going. And we could build up a large community of network rendering. Okay, so basically we're taking the concept of render farm and decentralizing it. And instead of using the cloud, so to speak, we're able to use um, uh, FTP transfer to make it work. So. Um, this thing is actually intended to be quite intelligent, and that's part of the reason why it's you know, called Skynet, at least internally for now. And that's so that um, uh, we can you know, uh, work with different machines, different configs, um, centralize all the configuration files, make sure that everything is uh, properly there. The queue testing works, it'll render a frame, test, verify, it'll make sure that nobody's dropped off the network, and if they have, deal with it, that sort of thing. So this is the first incarnation of it that I've physically seen and touched um, for beta, uh, and this is um, what I want to talk to you guys about. So um, very straightforward stuff. You know, 
under the hood though it's a little bit more complex um, you've got your lightning render name you can give your machine a name whatever it might be um, you've got your logging options uh, the timeouts and you can import and export sins which is great this is a new thing that um, uh, is always you know, kind of handy um, Part of the reason why this thing has kind of come to fruition is because Lightweight 2018 introduced a lot of changes with a lot of render uh, controls were broken, and um, Joe recognized that as well and said, okay, well, you know, we'll make this, this, this work. And of course, um, making it work with uh, older versions isn't really too much of an issue either because you're just launching um, scrimmage commands. But this thing is a little bit more uh, smart than just um, a simple queue and, and runner. Um, the local queue, this local queue, <laughs> directory uh, is intended to basically cache all the necessary files for transfer um, and your project files. So think of this as like a temporary project folder directory. So in some ways this is kind of similar to um, say butterfly net render, but um, this gets blown out automatically. One of the things that kind of always bothered me about butterfly net render at least years ago uh, was that it would kind of like cache this stuff in a corner and then leave it there and your C drive would fill up and get huge. Um, this gives you the ability to specify this. This could be a network folder and it'll go in and delete uh, the stuff after um, a periodic uh, time schedule. Okay, so uh, enable remote queuing uh, and you can be able to select your protocol, FTP. SHTP, SHFTP or SFTP will probably be coming very shortly. I don't want to speak for um, Joe though, but um, we'll see how that goes. Then we've got our um, Username, password, everything for local cache. This is all straightforward FTP stuff. Um, and of course, you're managing the queue database. Watch this particular directory for queue logs and the interval 60 seconds and away we go. Okay, so that's those settings. Uh, you can check the queue. There's nothing you know, currently active. Uh, then you've got analyze local queue. And if I had something running that's been going, and of course, your logs. And of course, your about box. Ooh. And there we go. Now, this is physically controlled through an L script. Um, this is the part that I haven't actually gone to install just yet, so um, let's take an opportunity to do that right now and see what we get. So I've physically not seen this before, so this is all very, very live. Any questions, comments? Nope, none yet. Well, just keep, uh, keep an eye on your chat box, too. Uh, I've got the open on the other window. Cool. Okay, so here comes Lightweight. Yeah, and I've got another copy of Lightweight running in the corner, so I don't know how well this is going to work, but we'll see. Okay, so let's get rid of this stuff over here. Let's go edit and uh, script. Plug in, set the plugins. Let's go desktop. Yay, two plugins have been added successfully. Uh, and then you lay out. Let's call this. Okay. And we'll go. Okay. And we'll go. Of course, I have no idea what these things are called. I may actually have to get Joe to come in and say, hey, what's this? Because he didn't give me any instructions with this whatsoever. Um, anybody know how to search what the latest uh, L script is that you've added for plugins and stuff? So I can never remember that. Yes, I was a field seller caller. Oh, let's see if we can find it. We're here. Eric. It's going to be a little bit hard to find. It's probably you know something more generic, uh, like light Q or you know just Q and other stuff. So that's going to be a little tricky. I'm going to have to ask Joe about this. But um, the general concept of this is just literally it's well actually maybe it's a master plugin. Hello, master plugin. 
that's your channel. No. Oh, of course not. All right, let's see if Joe's around. Now. No, Joe. <laughs> if all those fails, talk to Joe until you get that Joe's not here. Mm hmm. Well, Dave's not here. No, Dave's here. <laughs> What's Dave's, Dave up to? Is Dave here? Let me check. Let's see if Dave's here. Oh, Dave's not here. <laughs> I'm thinking of Dave Gerard, by the way. How is everybody else in the world? Let's go and do this. What we can do is probably open up the L script itself and figure out what that actual command is. Boom. Me cats. So content. Oh, yeah, settings. Set panel text. Dave, how you doing? It's Dave Ritter, everybody. <laughs> hey, everybody. Let's see. Let's see if anybody's jumped in on the... Uh... Nope. That Dave is there. Okay, so question to the group. Okay, um, how can I uh, find the actual name of whatever the last plugin was? Like, it's supposed to be last plugin. The last plugin? Oh, all right. Matt had a tool for this, didn't he? Uh, I think so. So add plugins, edit plugin, last plugin. Yeah, you should. That should work. No, that that's last plugin activated, and that's... I haven't activated anything yet. So oh, oh. Uh, I need to figure out what the. Do you remember the name? The... Do you remember the name of it all, or the first letter of the name? Well, it should be just Lightnet. So um, let's go. Lightnet. Plugins. Go add plugins. What about go to menu layout, and then search it there. Light, 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 light. Lightnet. And a plugin you have added on in there. Lightnet settings. It's P, okay, yeah, duh. That's P for plugins, right? Of course. Because it's settings. Wow. Okay, so what is the command? You can scan the directory and maybe it'll it'll just grab everything and see it. Well, I, th I think what's going on here is let's close this down. Let it write the configs, open it back up. Okay. And this is a good learning experience for everybody else too. And uh, oh, I, you know, I, I, I always forget this stuff. So it's like, oh, okay. You know, yeah, you know, oh, it's, it's, it's so easy to do, especially with 3D in general. This, it's so 3D in general is so sophisticated that you really have to keep practicing with it and whatever you don't practice with is easy to forget <laughs> so like the okay. other day I okay. forgot my shortcut command for merge polys or merge adjacent polys which of course is control um, control Z or command Z right. well, no it's, it's a shift Z shift Z or command Z I think it's shift Z it's shift Z 
And um, I, I, I haven't done that in so long. <laughs> I forgot the shortcut. I knew what I needed, but I forgot the shortcut. Yeah, so Dan, Dan Kenobi is saying that, oh, he's, he's glad he's not the only one who forgives. Yeah, Gloom KB said he, he, he's agreeing with me. It's shift Z. It's like if you don't practice with certain aspects, I mean, you may be really yeah, you good. you totally forget it. If you totally forget um, it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, what I would really like is, um, let's activate master. Unique master. Um, what I would really like to see in Lightwave is um, hover overable tools. Yeah. And it just tells you all the stuff. Right. Um, so when you mouse over it, it gives you the shortcut and um, what the um, option is. So has Oliver created a plugin for that at all? Mm, probably not. Okay. That's something that I don't think has been done. Okay. No. Anyway, so um, you know, you know what I like is that is that um, um, that shortcut wheel that Maya uses. Mm -hmm. um, what do you call that? It's um, I forget the, the official name for it. But I would like to see somebody develop something like that. I mean, I have to talk to Oliver and see if he... Like, who has one? Who has one? Lightwave has one. It's not totally the same, but Lightwave has one. Well, show me. Show us. I have no idea. Um, um, it's, it's, a control. It, it's, it's... It's not the shift uh, control left click, is it? Um, yes, shift it is. control. Okay, I know that one. <laughs> that one, that one I use. I use that quite... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I use that quite a bit. I would love, I love to see the one where you kind of go around in the circle. It's kind of a neat um, idea. I think, I think Oliver does actually have something like that. Um, All right. But it's, uh, uh, it's done in kind of like a hierarchical, almost looks like this, which is the um, schematic view. Okay. It has a, a look like this, these score buttons. Oh, that's great. And they go around, go around the, the bottom. So you know, that kind of stuff isn't really difficult to do. Okay, it's so just, you know, so, just done it. so you so, okay you did a what you just did was a hierarchical view with the camera and the light. Just it's just schematic. Go to schematic, got it. Yeah, but it, like literally the buttons are drawn like this, and the thing that I think I saw Oliver do. Pretty sure it was Oliver actually. Where is Oliver? Um, he's he well, know what Oliver has been working on a project actually, a, a movie. So oh, yeah, well, that's right. He's doing some horror movies. Yeah, he's do, do, doing some type of a movie, which is I think it's going to last through the summer. So that's why I haven't. I mean, I, I, he and I usually get together and chat or, or, or get together for lunch. But um, he's been busy on that movie thing. So I have to give him a call back and see how he's doing and what his schedule is like. Right, right. Um, and then Ruskler, Ruskler 3D mentions mentions or one sh or, or one program shortcut is different from another program shortcuts. I mean, I mean, I do a lot. As everybody knows, I do a lot of a lot of Photoshop. Also, ilus not not Illustrator, but Illustrator, yes. But After Effects and Premiere Pro, and then I've got Lightwave and Maya. And after a while, it's amazing how much the human brain can remember. Because yeah. when I jump into Maya, it's like I remember those shortcuts. I go into Photoshop, I remember those shortcuts. Some things I might forget, but for overall, I'll remember them. But it's like you have to constantly work in all these programs, or you just forget them all. <laughs> well, I, I've been also bouncing back and forth to sound software um, over the last um, oh, uh, couple yeah. of months here because I'm working on a couple of new tracks. But uh, I completely forgotten all of my final draft stuff, so that was kind of problematic. And it's like, okay, I'm trying to write something for a character. It's like, oh, geez, what's the shortcut for character? Oh, what's the shortcut for action? Um, all that stuff. So anyway, I found a little menu window that goes in here. Okay. Um, this is basically so your content which groups you want to participate in, and you can split it up by segments. Now, I don't exactly know what the segment function is, uh, but the preserve output prefix is um, uh, basically a bypass for uh, the um, way that Lightwave currently does its saving system. Okay, so under your render properties, we'll go to your output. It's your render prefix information, so you can bypass that through here. Okay, so um, once I get some more um, information, some testing done internally, and uh, Joe and I do some FTP tests over the net, uh, and probably get uh, Jim Talley to uh, do some, because he's got a bunch of rack mount uh, Xeons that he uh, picked up uh, at auction or something like that. We'll do uh, some more internal testing, but I want to get this going with um, some beta testers as well. So if you want to get in on the beta testing side of this, and keep in mind that this is going to be a commercial product, but we're going to try to do the uh, pricing on this in a very interesting way. Um, one of the suggestions, and this is just for the suggestion, is that um, you may be able to use this for free uh, so long as your machine is contributing. 
Um, that means, unfortunately, that all of your files and everything else is exposed to everybody else, but um, you will be able to access people in those groups that I was talking about, like a shoutcast station list. So if you want to join that group, that group, that group, that group, and they're all open for rendering, then they will be open for rendering. Um, and stuff will just queue and do its thing. That way we can turn the entire Lightwave community into one big render farm. And render farms can also participate, but they may um, participate in a way uh, that's uh, partially built or built as a contributor, but we can distribute more of that rendering off to other people and if they're contributing as well. Now, part of that is intended to be driven by a cryptocurrency system, uh, which I've been conceptualizing for the last two years, but unfortunately um, there's... You know, some issues with trying to do it that way because not everybody has the ability to access um, uh, cryptocurrency. Uh, we might be able to sell it off of uh, Liberty 3D and just issue it manually. That's one way to do it. We could airdrop it. There may be ways that so you could earn the currency by contributing to rendering, and then that currency that can be converted to actual cash for a render farm to get out of a job. So we'll see how that goes. That's all still stuff that's um, uh, business plan oriented that's uh, actually quite involved to work out. But um, we have uh, uh, cryptocurrency internally uh, called Lightwaves, um, which is on the Waves platform. Um, let me just actually pull that up. I'll show you guys what I mean here. Where's my Waves? Waves, start Waves. Okay, and this is Waves. So me being the smart ass that I am, um, I call it Lightwaves. A second here. I'll show you what I mean with the assets. Okay. Oh, wrong password. I did that. Can't type when I'm doing that. Okay. Nope. There we go. Okay, so. Here's my asset list, and I have a bunch of assets in here. I think uh, LightWiki has some light waves. Yeah, LightWiki comes on and share. Just oh. saying. So here's <laughs> light waves. There are twenty point uh, two hundred forty point nine million light waves. They have no value currently because um, they haven't traded or been sold or bought or anything like that, uh, which is normal. That's that's a big deal. Um, funny thing though. Um, Here's the value of Kitty Coin. <laughs> Kitty Coin. Is that a new coin yeah. we're going to get? Like a Bitcoin? Um, well, it, it's my own coin. Like, you can go on waves and issue your own coin very easily. Boy, look at this. Um, look at the guy right It uh, costs one wave, or one look, wave to do, which currently I think is about five bucks. Look, so the waves, look, look, look at the guy that's value. two steps above uh, uh, Kitty Coin. Hmm? The two guy, two steps above Kitty Coin? Boy, it's not an interesting name. Well, yeah, that's just some random coin that some dude threw out there. Um, these are all the assets that I have. The ones that I've created are uh, these ridiculously high number ones, which have no value. Um, there's Wavelight. Um, this is actually some weird currency that some you know, gave me. I'm like, okay. Um, that if I don't find these ones that I've created. Um, light Waves and Light Forms, that's for something else. We won't talk about that. Uh, and then Waves is uh, currently, uh, what is the value of Waves? It's um, currently trading at Waves to be BTC, Waves to US dollar. Uh, the current value of Waves is $2.80. So for $2.80, you can create your own um, cryptocurrency and start trading it on this exchange. So Dana Kenobi is wondering what is Waves client again? Well, Waves Client is the basic um, trading system for um, this Waves wallet that I have, and it keeps all of my assets in here. Um, and it allows you to have a decentralized exchange working with you. So, for example, if I want to you know, buy and sell some Kitty Coin to Waves, I can do it right here. So, I can sell, you know, one Kitty Coin, or yeah, one Kitty Coin for yeah. five, <laughs> Waves. So we can make up our own yeah. money now. Yeah. I like it's really easy. I like Steve Coin. Coin. Or I'll just click here and buy it. That'll do it. Oh, buy kitty coin. Oh, oh, just bought myself a kitty coin. Or just created. It. Oh, bump. And we're going to see how it changed there. So I sold one kitty coin. Bought one kitty coin. Dun, dun. 
<laughs> and if I go back over to my assets list, you'll see the new value of Kitty Coin here pop up in a second. It's Kitty Coin, Kitty Coin, Kitty Coin. There it is. Whole new world of currency. Earl says, "Hey, Earl, welcome." Um, like it's like it's like we don't have enough to keep us busy, and now we've got this. <laughs> yep, yeah, well, I know. But, um, the idea is that uh, if we do integrate the cryptocurrency um, aspect of it, um, it'll just be used basically as a medium for um, buying and selling time, and that's you know time is money. That's just how that works. Um, of course, you know CPUs cost money to run. Um, so if you want to contribute to the network, which gives you back rendering time, then you can get currency for contributing rendering time. Um, and if you need rendering time, you can buy the rendering time, um, and then it could be distributed to the people who are out there with the machines that render. So the idea is not to shaft render farms. The idea is to expand render farms um, by allowing for them to participate in a network such as this with um, LightNet, um, currently you know, co-named uh, uh, Skynet, but the concept is, is that you know, once you have um, your, your screen launched, you're basically going to be part of that system. And uh, if you have your FTP information uh, logged in, it's all ready to go for you. Oops, let's go to the settings uh, via the FTP. So if I need the robot queue, set up an FTP server, this thing will automatically log in and shovel that stuff back and forth. And literally, this is this is very straightforward to do. Sitting at the FTP server can be done um, at home. It can be done on a server somewhere. It can be done in the cloud. Uh, very, very straightforward and easy to do. And uh, we may um, uh, uh, contribute some of our own FTP capacity to do this um, during the testing phase. And then from there, we'll, we'll see where it goes. So um, I know this isn't you know super impressive just yet, because literally, I just fired this up like the night before and then had to put it away because it was finishing something. And uh, away we go. So. Um, this is going to be something we're going to be uh, testing and we need beta testers, so email me at support at liberty3d.com and we'll get you in there. Now, um, where's uh, Dave at now? Is he still alive? You're talking about Dave on the, um, on, on the, um, hold on a second. You're talking about Dave on Adobe Connect? Yeah. Um, that Dave's not presenting. He's, he, he's, he's the, um, he, he's, he's not presenting. Oh, he's just hanging out? He's just hanging out. All right, who, who else is hanging out? Nobody, just you and me. Oh, I didn't want it to turn into the cat show. Oh, that's all right. Sometimes it happens. That's that's what the, the, the this is all impromptu. The round table. Mm. If anybody else wants to jump in, let me know, and I will get you involved. I can. I'll, I'll, I'll post a link again now. I mean, you can just think of anything, anything else you want to do. I mean, it's, 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 well, I know that um, everybody's you know, kind of uh, chomping the bit for no TFD information. Yeah. Um, I can't tell you what Yasha told me because um, it's speculative type stuff. Um, but uh, uh, what I will say is that um, there's no reason for anybody to panic. <laughs> um, it's, it's all good. Uh, the uh, thing that I will do right now, though, is we will go to this Afterburner project. Um, this is something that I was uh, showing some of the other people in the... Um, Turbulence FD for Lightwave uh, Facebook page, um, which you should be able to find if you've got uh, Facebook going. Just look for it, Turbulence FD for Lightwave. And um, join that group. And uh, actually, it's the largest TFD group on Facebook, which means that the C4D people are not, you know, kicking our ass, so to speak. Um, we're, we're much larger than uh, the largest um TFD group. We've got almost 100 members. The largest TFD group that I've been able to find is like 45. So, um, and it's not active at all. It's just like, what the hell? So, uh, but uh, the C4D groups that I have joined to try to promote the um, last group buy in were extremely hostile to the idea of you know, saving money. I'm like, what the hell? Um, didn't really make a lot of sense to me, but uh, that's just you know kind of it with um, some of these groups. Now, uh, I believe I have this cached. Yes, I do. So, there we go. All right. Now, um, this um, uh, was a demo that uh, I put together because somebody wanted to uh, check it out. Now, we'll just crank this out. This is um, uh, quite detailed, so it's going to chug away a little bit. But you can see even in OpenGL, it's doing exactly what somebody wanted for an afterburner. And I'll show everybody how the settings were done for this. The 
reason why this is being slow is that this container size is, well, the voxel size is pretty small, but the container is pretty big, so it's a lot of data. Now, what I'm trying to find out if it will actually work is if I can run this in a loop, because there's no loop function in TFT, so you can't pick an in and an out spot, it's a loop. Um, so I'm thinking I might be able to do it by hacking the file names of the TFT cache and copying them as many frames as I need and then running them in the loop that way. So we'll let this cache. Can you just hold on there a second, Stephen? I'm gonna go grab some drink. Sure, no problem. All right, hey, man, hold on. And he'll be right back. So, um, I'm gonna post the link to anybody who is interested in presenting, give me a hot second here. And I posted it earlier, but I'll just kind of keep doing it here. Let me get this typed into the, there we go. And let me come over here and grab um, Lightwave 3D. All right. So it's the adobe.experts.adobeconnect.com forward slash lightwave 3D, posting it now. So if for anyone who's interested in, in presenting, go there. And let me just check real quick to see. Who's in? Okay. All right. I've returned. This goes off to the side here. Close this down. And Light Wiki is coming on after you. He said, he said, give him about five more minutes. He's got small children running around. Oh, I'm sure he does. Small animals. That's small. Well. I think I think uh, I think he has kids if I remember correctly. If seen on Facebook, he'll, he'll he share that more. I think he's got three kids, two at least. Two kids. But you know what? It's like one's enough. And I, I met this lady <laughs> one time, and I was doing a presentation, and on, on digital artistry, and um, one lady in the audience says, "We've got with her husband was there. We got ten kids, ten kids, ten kids." I was so shocked, and it just came out of my mouth. I looked at her and I said. What were you doing that you've got 10 kids? <laughs> well, I think it's pretty obvious. <laughs> yeah. And she admitted she adopted half of them. <laughs> oh, so it was this extra shock wall? Right. <laughs> oh, okay. So as I said, this is um, a pretty detailed um, resolution. Um, so, I could probably get away with um, not using this much um, uh, voxel data, but I wanted to ensure that it was interfacing properly with the um, collision objects. So I was actually trying to get it to okay. flow over these little micro fins that are in here. All right, so are these, okay, are we looking at particles? Mm -hmm. No? There are no particles whatsoever in this at all. Okay, what are we looking at? This Tell is, us. Well, this is strictly just a, um, uh, a TFT volume that's being generated by a disk that's in the back of this engine container. So now what we've seen what this preview looks like, we can actually take a look at uh, what this thing and, and, and is de really And definitely about. share with the group this setup here. How did you do this? Yeah. Okay, well, this is this is very straightforward. Um, let's go to the scene editor, and uh, this is going to go into a tutorial about how this was done. But there's basically a nozzle, and there's our emitter, and then we've got our container and our flume pusher or plume pusher. Okay, so um, let's go and take a look at this in wireframe mode, and you can see exactly what's what. Okay, so um, very simple setup. And the beautiful thing about these types of dynamic systems is that they will behave because they're based on physics, um, very much like what you want it to uh, to be. So I don't mean to move it, that's for sure. Okay, so this uh, disc back here right. um, basically causes the TFT volume um, to be pushed back. Uh, there's no wind involved with this because I didn't want wind. Because um, if you got wind and then you're you know, moving it in another direction, you got other problems. Um, and uh, this, uh, I believe, um, uh, Sean Lee Bishop uh, went and kind of replicated it and did what he needed to do with the... Uh, um, TFD for his uh, Firefly uh, video that he did. Now this is a plugin, right? Which? This is a plugin? 
Yeah, this is TFT. Third third party. Yeah. Okay. So you, you own this, don't you? Didn't you buy the student version? No, Where I didn't yet. I was supposed to, and I didn't. Slacker. I know, um, total. Educational. Total slacker. Yeah, you, you got stuff going on. I, so really? Do stuff. More stuff. All okay, right. so uh, let's take a look at the container. Okay. First things first. Um, this container, the voxel size, is actually default, but it's set by 5 by 5 by 10 meters. So the actual voxel volume is 32.84. Uh, mega voxels, so it's a million voxels. So there's 34.2 million or, or 34.8 million voxels in here. So um, this is uh, quite a heavy uh, container, but the reason why it takes so long to calculate is because I'm doing some um, pretty interesting uh, stuff when it comes to um, collision objects detection and simulation itself, plus there's subframes in here. And subframes and pressure duration limit will always take more time but you'll get more accurate results for what you want. So let's go take a look at what we got here for fire shader. This is just left literally normal for the curve itself, for the mapping of the curve for the fire shader. Um, but I've done some very interesting things here with the color and opacity. Not a lot of people know this, but um, you can tweak these values well past 100% and it'll change the color drastically. So, you know, you can do some very interesting stuff with your so, color values just by dialing them in so using the arrows. So Dana, and that will choke off the spectrum. So Dana Kenobi asked a question. He says, "Can you show the checkered, um, the checkered panel real quick?" Uh, yeah. Hold on a second. Uh, viewport render. Show the grid today. There you go. So that's how detailed it is. That checkered grid represents one of those voxels. Now, the rule wow. that's supposed to be in this is that for each pixel that you have on screen, you should have a voxel, okay, okay. To, to make it that way. But, you know, the amount of data that you'd be using to consume is extremely, you know, high end. And the point of this stuff is that you can fill in the blanks, so to speak, using the um, turbulence texture uh, to give it the motion that you're looking for. So, um I didn't need it to be anywhere near this large. I could double this and easily you know, get away with what I want. Um, but uh, it's going to modify my shading for the texture. If I have my subgrip detail, I have to change that so it won't pop on me. Wow. Um, and you know, literally, it's, it should be just technically slightly smaller. It's mostly the smoke shader that will do that. Um, and I don't actually have the smoke shader enabled on this. Um, it's just this. So what we're Our looking at is a, 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 this is kind of a, a, a two-dimensional preview of the detail that we're going to get. Yeah. Okay. So it's literally, you know, if I'm looking at it from left side, okay, right. that's the representation of it for the grid. So when I have the fire going out the back of this thing, nope, we don't want to view VPR, they'll take forever. This represents one dot or one pixel. Got it. Or one, one voxel itself. So if you were uh, the camera, okay, and the camera's at the side, let's go to the side. You can see just how big these things are being represented. Now, that's more than one pixel, obviously. Um, but over here, you know, you're getting closer down, but it's still way more than one pixel. But each one of those um, squares represents one of these voxel cubes. And the concept behind turbulence fluid dynamics um, or computational fluid dynamics when rendered with a shader like this is that, as I said before, each pixel should be the size of a voxel. Um, so if your voxel uh, size value is up to 20 millimeters and you need to be on screen for something that's you know, uh, 20 feet away or whatever it might be, you can um, probably change the voxel size to something much larger than what it physically um, should be in the real world and then fill in the blanks with the turbulence texture system. Um, and that's that's the whole way that it's, it's done. It's kind of a cheat on a couple of those things, but uh, you can see in here though that this thing has, whoops, shoot it's all please, um, some fins on it. And these fins are intended to actually help break up the 
smoker or the fire as it comes off the back or the, the, the fluid that comes off the back. So um, let's go take a look at the simulation itself so we know what we're actually calculating here. So here's the temperature, okay? You got your cooling. This is actually set up really high, so it cools off really fast, and its half-life basically is calculated off of that value. Uh, there's no buoyancy in here, so this is just left to default, but I set the buoyancy to zero. Uh, then we've got our density. Now, the reason why I have the density in there, um, so I was playing along uh, with trying to get um, a density to help break up some of the um, uh, fluid calculation for the uh, temperature channel. And, of course, I had fuel masking in there. And it didn't go with burn. But the idea was, is okay, uh, we've got some expansion that's running off of this thing. And that expansion contributes to the temperature emission that's coming off of the actual emitter. And the density emission also contributes to it. So um, by doing it this way, I was able to get the uh, look that pretty much sells that this is an afterburner effect. Um, but the calculation time necessary for this, because of the amount of channels, uh, even though I'm only displaying one of them in the viewport, it's got to load all that data. So that's why it's slow. If I ditched off these other two channels, this thing would calculate very, very quickly, um, even at that uh, resolution. But the um, point of going through doing that is that the containers themselves, okay, that's the container window. Let's go to the actual uh, emitter windows. The nozzle is this object here. Let's go and select the nozzle object, okay? And this is our main emitter, and this has got a radius of 35 millimeters. It's actually a little bit higher than what it needs to be, but I set it to this because it was just giving me a you know, quick calculation. And it's actually got a force applied to it on the z-axis to give it that blast effect going out the back. Okay, so this whole thing is affecting the container, okay? So anything that's in here that's generating something is going to be affected by the whole nozzle. Now, if I was um, a little bit more... Uh, fancy about this, I would just take the inside of this and use that as the emitter uh, for the collision object, and that becomes the geometry that's kicking off directional force. Okay, because you can have forces um, applied to an object without them actually kicking off a channel. Okay, you can see that this does not have a temperature channel, value set, density, fuel, or anything like that. Okay, and here's the actual emitter. All right, so the emitter itself, this is ball, okay? So basically your fuel is being spit in here at whatever rate, and then it ignites, and then I have the um, plume pusher back here doing some extra work to combine to get it out the back of this thing very fast. And you can see that the plume pusher also has a temperature value set, and it's also got fuel set to one. And that fuel value when it kicks off, it drives the expansion of the fuel and temperature emission and density emission as well. Um, so these things are basically combining to produce the actual um, fluid channels that are being sheeted while being disturbed by another fluid channel that isn't being sheeted, which is the density in the fuel mask. So um, these things all combine together to give us the effect. But the force of this thing is really, really high. Like this plume pusher, um, we've got it pushing back at a normal force of one kilometer. I actually looked the stuff up and it's somewhat similar to what you would see on an F-14. Um, and uh, we've got minus one kilometer Z and the normal force is one kilometer. So just combined like that, it gives us what we're looking for. But this is really the kicker. The emitter has a pressure of set to 50 plus the minus of 500 meters and normal force of 50 meters. So the uh, calculations for all this, because it's so much um, value kicking out, uh, I had to have subframe steps in here. Otherwise, it would just expand beyond the, the um, uh, collision object, and it would start to you know, do some really weird, weird stuff. So you need to have um, those collision objects set to a very close um, proximity to the actual surface of the object, and you also have to have the container set with the simulation so that you've got some subframe steps in there so it can catch the motion of the calculating volume as it expands and intersects that geometry without skipping it. Otherwise, it's just going to you know, go past it. It's very similar to particles in that way um, or any other type of dynamics uh, such as uh, Cyflex or um, Bullet. It's needing some more information between a frame because it's expanding so fast and there's so much pressure being added to it and it's being 
kicked off the back of it so fast that if you don't have those some frame steps in there, it won't collide with the object because it'll miss it by the time the next frame is there. So um, uh, it's, think of uh, uh, subframes as literally just subsections of a slice of time. Uh, so if you've got a second, you can have like one millisecond um, or you know, uh, your one minute has seconds, same thing. So if it's gonna expand that much in this much time, you need to make sure that it actually sees that object before um, calculating the next step. And if it doesn't, it's out here already and then you get all kinds of other problems. But uh, this isn't really a hugely complicated setup. This took me about 45 minutes to set up, do, test, calculate, and go, okay, that's where I'm gonna recalculate and it was done. So um, nothing really, really crazy there. The thing that um, uh, really like to be able to see here in TFD in a future version is the ability to loop stuff. Um, it's possible that you could do this through an envelope, but I'm really not sure how uh, that would work with the graph editor if you can do a loop for time. Um, you can reverse it, uh, you can slow it down, play it back, um, but I don't know if you can actually loop something. Uh, it'd be really great if we had a modifier like a loop, <laughs> and we'd be able to do that. It's like, take it from here and then loop it back, take it from here and loop it back, take it from here and loop it back, and that'd be really great. But I don't know of any plugin that actually has that capability. If anybody does, that would be really, really, really awesome if you could uh, uh, let me know about that because I'd really like to take a look at it. So, anyway, the um, vorticity on this is literally set to zero, and we have no wind on this because it's not going to be affected by wind because it's going too fast. Um, and of course, uh, the turbulence settings, to take, let's take a look at this. This is uh, set to 10 millimeters um, intensity, and the density channel is what's driving. Even though it's not being shaded, it's what's driving the intensity channel for the turbulence input. Okay, and then um, your turbulence small size. Uh, this is set to basically to the same size as the voxel uh, space, and then our largest size is 500 millimeters. Uh, that gives it a little bit of a ripple um, that's visible, but giving it the nice chunky results for calculation. And most of this is being done through calculation. This shading, like this, this, the shape and chew. You guys know what I'm referring to? It's not just the shader alone that's doing this. But realistically, if I want to, I could probably do that with just the the shader. So like for example, uh, let's set this to um, 0 0.01, so 10 millimeters. And you know, in OpenGL, this isn't really gonna shift very much. But if I did a render of this, you'd be able to see the difference right away. But the intensity is so low anyways, um, it's really not going to impact it. Like I pretty much turn this off and do a render and it'll still keep the shape with the very interesting variances there. Um, but it's not going to break up just enough for me to be satisfied with it. So that's why I've still got fire noise intensity applied. It's just very, very minimal. Um, and really what I'm doing here is getting this fire noise to contribute to um, some of the fast moving gas effect. And that's why my fire noise speed is set to four rather than the normal fire noise speed, which I think is just um, one and this is normally uh, five point or point five six or point yeah I think it's point five six that's that's what the normal settings are so um, wow. that's how I set this up and it's that's... it's literally something that uh, you can set up really quickly but because of the way that I'm using these additional channels in the simulation the calculation is going to take a little bit of time uh, I think it was what, 25 minutes for me to calculate it and uh, it's going to suck up a significant amount of data. Um, let's just go in and take a look at this for the size of the files. Okay. Nice. And, you know, it starts off, you know, 13K, bump, 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 and then immediately, you know, you're looking at 70 megabytes, 160, 250, uh, 285, and then it stays around about 280 to 290, just roughly. And, you know, it's quite a bit of data per frame to load. And this is on an SSD drive. This is on a Mushkin Reactor 3. It's a pretty fast SSD drive. I think you're on Shmushkin. Um, and you can see just you know, how big this stuff can get. Um, there's quite a bit of um, improvement that can be done in these files, uh, just in, in my opinion. And these actually compress really well, by the way. Uh, so if you need to transfer this via FTP, you can. Uh, you can literally let's just take one of these. At the end, we know this is um, 258 megabytes. Let's go to uh, a dark out bang. Let's go, well, some test. And you 
can see that that last same test, I don't know, pretty much the same size. I thought these would compress better. They used to. What the heck? Oh, you know what? I think it's actually already applied compression. Um, these things used to compress really, really well. Let's go out to your archive. Best. I should be using 7-zip for this, but whatever. How's your 3D printer doing? Yeah, actually made it bigger. Bizarre. Weird. Okay, anyway, can't be helped. Um, it used to compress really, really well. I'm thinking something else. Uh, actually, uh, yeah, I'm thinking of something else. Okay, so um, the only other thing on here um, you might want to you know, think about with this stuff because of the way that this is set up is just the collision sizes for the radius. Uh, those are very important, and just you know the fact that these are kicking things off. I want to expand this um, even further. There are two ways to do it. Um, the directional force is one way to get it to do it. But the other thing is, is that um, you got to remember how fast this thing is cooling off. Um, so it's literally, it's done. And that's the temperature. So if I kick this back to like, say, 50%, that plume is going to go way the heck out here. And with that, it's going to consume more of the voxel volume space. And that's going to require more data. Um, but you can vary um, the cooling over time with an envelope. So if you want to like throttle this forward and back, you can just using that envelope. And that's how you would make use of that. So if you want to hit the hit the gas basically on one of these afterburners, it's not just controlling the um, emission of the temperature channel for the emitter. It's a combination of that plus the cooling period. Okay, and that's how you would get that done. Anyone alive? Yum, yum, yum. I feel so alone. Okay. Uh, uh, yes, actually, um, it would be great for a Viper scene. Although the um, Vipers um, for Battlestar, we all did that with fire, volumetric lights, pretty much. Um, there was no real need for us to uh, get fancy with a computational fluid dynamic system. And when we were doing Galactica, that didn't exist for Lightwave. Um, and the computational stuff was really just coming out for... Um, 3 d Max, uh, and you know, of course, Houdini had it for a very long time. Um, and you know, you can pretty much get some form of computational fluid dynamic system for a uh, 3D program now, either for uh, a plugin um, such as TFD or FumeFX or uh, something along those lines, or it's built in, such as in Blender, Houdini, My Fluids, that sort of thing. Uh, My Fluids, really, though, I've not seen something like this done with it, so I don't even know if it's capable. My fluid is more for water, but it can do, um, um, you know, large explosions and stuff like that if you shade it. So, there it is. Stephanie, you still alive? Anyone? No one's alive. Thanks, Dan. Um, I will be posting this as a tutorial because there's a couple of other things in here that can be done. Uh, that'll be a very cheap one, like 15 bucks. So. Yes, um, that'll be on Liberty 3D, actually. This is probably the next tutorial doing. And then um, my uh, car cap project car commercial, uh, the sequel of that is being prepped now as well. Um, Unfortunately, that car commercial uh, tutorial was in preparation for doing a uh, PSA for um, Transport Canada, uh, where they're telling people, please don't text and drive, don't distract and drive, all that kind of jazz. Uh, they've decided to do the uh, visual, they decided to do the car crash not using visual effects, but actual cars. I'm like, okay. Um, so they're going to wreck uh, a Chrysler 300C, <laughs> which is. You know, just bizarre. They think they could do it cheaper than they can with visual effects. I'm like, hey, yeah, do, do whatever you got to do. But anyway, um, I'm going to turn uh, what was going to be that car crash uh, commercial PSA 
into a tutorial that's going to involve uh, Bullet, and I'm going to see if I can also involve uh, Monomorphic and stuff to buy a copy, though. So I'm still prepping that material, uh, but this uh, tutorial with um, Computational Fluid Dynamics Turbulence FDE uh, is going to be first, and then we'll uh, jump into some other stuff, and we'll see where we at uh, with the car commercial stuff. And uh, I also have a broadcast logo um, tutorial coming out. So um, a lot of people are like, oh, yeah, we gave up the whole broadcast logo market to Cinema 4D. Well, not really. Just a lot of people who use Lightweight don't do broadcast logos anymore. So somebody asked me to do a broadcast logo recently for them, and I did it. I replicated basically the look that was done for something else in After Effects, but I did it completely in Lightwave. And uh, we're using Lightwave 2018 for that one. And um, uh, we'll have that one out shortly as well. So I uh, expect this stuff uh, to come out in the next few weeks. Um, this one probably will be out in a couple of days. So keep your eye out for that. And um, we're really wondering where Steph is. Either Lightwiki Steph or Steph Burns. Earth to Steph Burns. Meowing Cat to Mission Control. Carol. Here I am. Okay. Does anybody know where Steph went? Oh, that's quite possible. Did you have a heart attack or? I don't like to joke about that stuff, but I've actually been online and somebody's seen a croaked on me, so. Anybody remember that uh, scene from Day After Tomorrow? Where Porsche gets crushed by a truck. The guy's phone goes dead. Oh, possibly. That could be it. Well, anyway, um, more fun. Okay, so let's um, go and do something else here. All right. Edit, switch content directory. Yeah. Let's go this one. Let's see. Good. Um. Um. Uh. Actions archive. Yeah. So I'll show you the. the subject of our other tutorial that I got coming up. Bump. So this one's kind of fun. Give this one a generate here. You guys recognize this name. This is Phil Nelson's company, formerly New Tech. So I'll put this together for him. This actually looks pretty hot. Um, I'm still working out some of the volumetric effects, um, but uh, this thing uh, came together quite well. And it is a replication of something that was done in After Effects for Sportsnet or for the Booker World Tour or whatever. And uh, Built like that, so I reproduced it in layout and uh, just you know, very simple geometric shapes. And um, you gotta look at break down some of the stuff that these people are doing in Cinema 4D with the reactors and all that jazz and go, Look, you know, we can do this kind of work. This is really straightforward. This took me a couple of days basically to rework the timing a few bits, but to model this was literally, I don't know, um, a lunch hour uh, to get this done. So this wasn't really, you know, super drastic or anything to, to make happen. Um, I'm gonna folk VPR here because um, uh, we want to see what this looks like when it's rendering, but this is uh, something that really um, chokes because of the surfaces that I'm using, but um, let's go to here and we'll just enable VPR. So my computer starts to chunky for audio. That'll be why. Yeah, no, don't. Like, you know, if you want to learn it, go ahead. But, um, you know, it's a very powerful program, but it's got a lot of drawbacks. It really does. Um, and I'm not very impressed with its renderer, to be quite honest. Um, and I'm not impressed with the price tag that they're asking for. If New Tech wanted to do all that nifty stuff that they're doing and up the price to 1500 bucks, I would still be, you know, totally a lightweight user. I have no problems with that. Um, but, you know, a lot of that stuff I don't need because I can do it by hand. 
and I can do it probably faster than most of these people um, that were using Cinema 4D or using all these automated tools to make it work. So um, you know, the um, scene here uh, involves uh, a couple of interesting things, though, and I don't want to give too much of this away because this is a tutorial that's coming up. But uh, we're using lights that are geometry. Um, and this is the primitive light and primitive volume tech. Actually, this is just really primitive light tech. Is when we uh, lost DP custom lights, um, we needed a replacement for it. And that's what the solution is here. This is the primitive light type. You just select your object that you want to turn into a light and you parent it to where it needs to be and um, basically set it up the same way that it would uh, work as a regular light if the object itself was you know, a light bulb or a filament or whatever it might be and uh, do what you need to do. This gives you uh, a lot of control over a bunch of different things and you just got to make sure that you have your objects set properly for exclusion so that you're not actually lighting an object from itself um, and therefore cutting off the light. So you exclude the actual object that it's listed as. So this is layer 13. And you get what you're looking for. Uh, let's go and see here. You can see how fast that renders in VPR just there. Uh, it gets a little bit slower, though, when I get the other stuff on screen. What's really kicking it down is this surface here, which has a click map in it. And this grid, just because of the work involved on it, plus a couple of the textures, is what's killing it. It's really not a sophisticated node flow. It's just uh, maybe I've got to do a bit more math to get it going. I've got this um, wonderful um, Bristol BSDF shader and the dielectric working together, and that's always going to take some time. Part of this tutorial is about optimizing your scene for rendering. Um, I'm not still a fan of rendering everything in camera. Um, there's a lot in this particular local that uh, really shouldn't be rendered in camera because it's going to require um, some compositing tricks to make it all work. Uh, so this is all going to get broken out into scene. That's also going to go into uh, the compositing side. But um, this was very, very straightforward for me to put up um, and put together. Uh, getting the animation timer was another question. but. The, uh, the client was basically, you know, say, hey, can we make this thing like this? And pretty much replicated the exact same thing that I found on YouTube for this reference. And um, it really wasn't all that, you know, strenuous. It's been a while since it's been a lot broadcast, although it's been almost, geez, 18 years. Um, so this was actually kind of fun to get back into and do. So um, I think, you know, everybody should uh, pick this one up when it comes out. And I'm saying that to just sell it. I'm saying that to you know, get people in the Lightwave community to start doing more broadcast local work because um, it, Lightwave is the original 3D broadcast local software, uh, really. That's uh, uh, the whole reason why I was included on the video toaster. And then somebody said, hey, well, we can make a spaceship. And poof, Babylon 5. A lot of people don't realize that. Um, the Lightwave software was literally intended to be a 3D titler um, when New Tech was you know, picking it up. So the um, evolution of the software over the years uh, has gone from um, 3D Tyler to 3D visual effects software package to um, game creation software package, uh, ArcViz, the whole works and covers all the gamuts, but we need to you know, remind ourselves every once in a while there's a lot of hanging fruit out there that we can grab um, for money or broadcast level work. And, you know, everybody's like, oh, there's no language work, there's no language work. Well, it's out there, you just gotta be a little creative on getting it and having a few broadcast locals on your reel can't hurt, um, especially if they're, you know, little uh, kick-ass looking and uh, you leverage the power of Lightways Render there. And a lot of people are using Octane at this point for speed, um, but, you know, when you're sitting here with a bunch of older computers that you can network together and just crank it out and you don't have to fuss with any setups and uh, pay for the extra expensive um, a couple of graphics cards and the Octane Render on top of it, um, just network those old machines together and start banging this stuff out because this is not very RAM heavy. This is minimal geometry, really, um, for most of what I would normally do. So um, it's not going to kill you if uh, you only have a couple of machines with like maybe four or even eight gigs of RAM um, to join to this stuff out. And uh, the thing that's going to kill me on this render, though, is that they want it in 4K. So uh, that's going to be a, a little bit involved. Um, this render is actually quite slow because some of these materials I haven't optimized them yet. So that's part of um, what that tutorial will be. 
and uh, hopefully stuff in here will pop back on and uh, we have another presenter where's uh, uh, go like what you key stiff stiff I can't do a Scottish accent don't know what happened to Steph Burns anybody um, what was that I, sorry there you are you I'm here. I just I was sweating back. I had to go to the back room over here. Okay, say that again. Oh, you were sweating it out? <laughs> what? <laughs> well, I, I didn't hear your question. What's that? You were sweating it out? Where'd you go? You, like, disappeared. Oh, no, I was, I was in the back. I was in the other room back here. Oh, okay. So you just casually walk away and let us have a free-for-all? Yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. All right, well, I've pretty much shown done my little contribution here so uh um, all right let's see uh, it that's, that's, we're, we're, i know that uh so scott's like floating there in the background all right, there. all right let's go see him here okay so scott is liberty is there okay so scott um if you're there um this is the the link to join in let's see graphics curse uh, let's see here let me um Stop sharing my screen. All right, go ahead and stop sharing your screen. And I there think, you, I, you know what, I put it up here as well. Let me go find a link. I just copied and pasted on here. All okay, right, nice. give me a hot minute, guys. I'll go ahead and... Dave G's participant was not presenting today? Um, I guess not. He's not here. I mean, they're, they're not all. I mean, it, it, it's always different who comes in and jumps in and, and shares. So, right. um, you know, they, they may they may come on in a little bit. So, you just never know. All right, let me wait some page. Okay, so Photoshop. Let me go over here. There we go. All right, everybody. So I'm going to go ahead and post this. Mm -hmm. For those who would like to come on, and uh, Light Wiki was there. He's um, there's the link. All right, so Light Wiki, you don't need to be on Skype. You don't. You don't need any. You don't need to have any other program. Just um, um, go nice. go to this link. Um, go to this link that I just posted. The Adobe okay. Connect. Experts.adobeconnect.com forward slash lightwave 3D. Um, just a couple of questions there yeah, in the sure. actual Twitch chat room. Yeah. Um, uh, JS1000, yes, it would be very cool if Lightwave had a CPU and GPU combined renderer. Um, that would be actually uh, very awesome. Oh, there is um, one actually, one last thing that I'd like to show you guys. Yeah, go Hold for on. it. Go for it. Okay, um, first monitor is a first monitor, sure. Um, you got it? Okay, so there's that. Okay. Now, um, there is a uh, really cool uh, German Lightwave user named Peter, and um, there is a very cool technology. He's joined this company, and um, uh, this is something for you ArcViz people out there. Now, right now, this thing only supports BIM format, but I think what may happen here is that if enough people push, they will support Lightwave, because uh, Peter's there working as a Lightwave artist, um, and he's... Um, Asked me just you know whether or not uh, there's a use for this in the Lightweight community. Well, like, absolutely, this is brilliant. Um, watch what you can do with this. Okay, there's some demos that you can go to. This it's called Enscape 3D. Okay, and I want everybody to actually go here, sign up for this because it's really kick ass. Oh wow! Um, we're gonna go to um, where me. There's the demos. Enscape3D.com. Okay. Yeah. I'm going okay. there right now. Go to the bottom of this page, and you can see some of their standalone viewers. Okay, and they've got this for VR as well as regular download. And this is literally a self-contained renderer with the viewer that ships. And I have a lot of really interesting concepts for how this could be used in the Lightwave community. I think this would just be real cool if we could get uh, this going for us because... Um, it will allow you to actually transport your work to somebody without them basically being able to rip it off. Um, they'd be able to see it, they'd be able to show it, but they wouldn't be able to actually go in and you know, manipulate it or you know, change anything. They'd have to go back to you and get it, and you could actually set this thing uh, to self-destruct after you know 24 hours or something like that. Um, and uh, you know you could do revision 
approval and changes. Um, we're going to go more info. Yes, run anyway. Now oh, check this out. Okay. All right, we're going to just turn An it off. An online renderer. This is interesting. This is, this is so kick-ass. Watch this. Well, this is brilliant. I would actually like to see this rendering technology integrated as an external uh, renderer, like where you have a VPR renderer in LightWave uh, 2018. Think about being able to actually be able to have access to this. Uh, and this is apparently all PBR support. Wow. So this should, the material should be able to convert over if they're done basically. Do the thing. Okay, so check that out. Boom, it's rendered. Really? Very cool. That's pretty wild. That's very cool. Yeah, and it's not it's not pushing polys here and just doing a a, a, a video game engine style render here. This is um, literally is doing a iterative ref re refinement of the image, and um, if you move around it, you can actually see that it does kind of a pseudo motion blur because of the way that it iteratively corrects the image as it refines and then finishes. Um, it's very impressive in terms of how fast it does this. And one of the um, ideas here is that this could be used for virtual sets very easily. Um, and you can actually sell and move uh, you know, virtual sets around uh, as part of a, a product. And you just basically uh, maximize this thing and stream it over to a TriCast or something like that. Um, that's uh, basically one of the ideas that I have for helping uh, lightweight artists get more working, getting back into the broadcast market, is to be able to start doing virtual set construction and then using a technology like this um, to stream the uh, data from, say, a virtual set server um, where all these things are loaded and you just select them and then switch them over uh, NDI to the TriCaster. And this is literally the perfect application for that um, because you can see just how quickly it renders. And in between camera switches, you just move to your different location or if you do happen to do it live, it renders so fast that literally it's a one, two, three, four. So, you know, it's it's not um, something where you can be letting, you know, VPR or even F prime. Okay, or, so uh, then what are you do this stuff? It's it's that quick. It's like boom, it's done. You know, so I'm noticing that it says it works with SketchUp and Auto Auto's Desk uh, Rivet as Rivet. well as Rhinoceros. Yeah. So then okay yeah, so then we're gonna export BIM. So then I mean basically what's the workflow? Show us the workflow. I mean, well, I, that's what I can't show you because I don't actually have this this thing. Um, you can get the demo. Um, you can go and download the demo itself. These are just like the visualization containers that I'm showing. Um, I haven't tried this in VR yet, which I actually should do because you can walk around it. Obviously, I'm doing a walk around in the other uh, uh, application just in 2D here with okay. those, uh, uh, the VR headset, but the uh, free trial is available. But it's not going to support anything except for BIM. Huh, okay. So really, you got Autodesk, Rivet, SketchUp, and Rhinoceros will export BIM, or BIM, and they have plugins for that, but they don't have anything for Maya, they don't have anything for Sidem 4D, they don't have anything for Max, they don't have anything for Lightwave. So I think if we push and say to this company, hey, we'd really like to have Lightwave support, anybody who does ArcViz is gonna totally love this thing, because it's, so easy to package this thing up and think of it as like a PowerPoint presentation for 3D artists. Okay. So, Very similar to what Chilled Web is doing with AR Portfolio, but this is like a full 3D viewer with renderer and you're not relying on game engines literally exporting Go. Okay. So now Rescular 3D says that uh, there's a sale on Toolbag 3 that can speed yeah, Marmoset. up. What was that? Marmoset. Marmoset, yeah. Uh, there's a sale going on. What, what, what's, what's the cost on Actually, can where, where do you purchase that? Um, I think it's just Marmoset 3D. Um, the uh, Ryan Roy is doing a lot of work with Marmoset. Um, he's using it as a previous and uh, online high-speed rendering tool um, for a couple of projects, which are secret that we've uh, kind of been working off and on uh, occasionally together, occasionally independently. Um, which, uh, uh, unfortunately, I don't think any of us can talk about until 2019. Um, but it's uh, uh, pretty much. Um, one of the larger projects that I've worked on in terms right. of the actual total so, value. So here's uh, Marmoset. Things. I think I found Marmoset tool bag. I'm clicking yep. on it now. Marmoset summer sale is alive. 50% off. 
Yep. Okay. There's a lot of great sales going on here. Two bag and, and viewer, um, two bag. Is it two bag? Um, let's see. I'm not, I, I'm, I've never worked with this before. Um, it's it's um, very similar in terms of um, uh, what you would expect for um, a game engine style renderer okay. system, but with you know inputs commands. Uh, it's uh, there's another um, uh, platform uh, that's very similar to it, whose name I forget at the moment. But if you've seen any of the Vizart or Vizrt um, technology um, right. for doing virtual sets and um, real time rendering in AR and uh, VR, uh, you'll get a good idea of where things are going. The, the the key word here that's happening in the 3D community is real time. It's real time, okay? right? Yeah. Okay. Now, not Octane is not a real-time renderer. Lightways VPR renderer is not a real-time renderer. This is not even a real-time renderer. Um, engines like Unity and um, Unreal and Marmoset and uh, the like with um, video game engine technology, those are all real-time renderers. Okay, Brigade so is actually a real-time renderer, so but it's an iterative real-time renderer. Uh, I guess you can classify this as being a real-time iterative renderer because you know, it doesn't have to do any crazy update and reset and start and all that kind of jazz and you can't you know I can run animation with this probably and it'll go like I can move the camera and it's doing all this stuff in real time it's doesn't look like complete crud and then it just you know improves it over time so you can classify this as a real time iterative render um, so that once you actually stop the motion it improves and it improves incredibly well okay. uh, video game engines are not like that they don't do the iterative um, uh, correction uh, although they have offline modes that will do it um, which is you know more anti-aliasing, more settings turned on, but ultimately um, they are real-time renderers. Uh, you know, several frames up to several hundred frames per second. Um, okay. Different kind of animal, different kind of beast. But this stuff is um, intended for archivist type people. But I could see this being a brilliant way of someone doing um, models for a TV show or models for a game, and being able to ship this around instead of you know losing their artwork. It exists in this environment, so. You know, you don't get ripped off, and if you want to pay it, then there could be a way for them to extract it, and you get paid on the other end. Right. And, of course, you could show and share this stuff. You know, uh, here's part of my portfolio. Download this and just flip through all these different scenes. And uh, what you see is what you get with this. And because it's so bloody fast, even on a laptop, this is going to be, you know, looking excellent. Okay. And it's immediately VR compatible. So it's all set up ready to go. I believe the editor gives the option to um, include VR or not, and it just it does all the setup for Oculus uh, Rift in for HTC Vive. Well, this is something I think would really, uh, I think something that would be wonderful if Lightwave had this built into it, um, or yeah. or at least in, in, into the um, as a renderer. Um, so yeah. we were um, I think either that, directly inside of the, the interface uh, via VPR floating window, yeah, or you know being able to stream it out somehow. Um, but ultimately, just being able to you know export BIM with the services intact from Lightwave would be great. Um, shipping this off to somebody uh, would be a really awesome way to show stuff off. And but I could see this becoming uh, kind of a different way of doing shopping for three D models. Right. Basically, hey. Um, I've got this beautiful environment. I want to walk into like a gun store and buy a, a gun for my video game. Um, and you can actually walk into a gun store and see all of it, see how it looks under different lighting conditions, and then just pick it off the shelf and go, okay, that one on Turbo Squid is twenty nine ninety five. Of course, or you know. Trainer box. Of course, you know how. Of course, you know how everybody loved their guns. <laughs> well, you know that's just an example, but um, you know you can see potentially them in an environment or on a firing range, see how they look. Um, another thing is cars. Okay, look at these cars. These are very simple, low poly cars. But the cars themselves, um, you know, maybe you want you want a car, and you've got all the different cars that are pretty much the same make and model or different years. But you don't know how well they're going to perform in terms of the look, quality, and mesh in a renderer, which is always the issue with anything from Turbo Squid or any other service. It's like, how's this going to look in my renderer? Right. How's this going to look in a renderer that's you know physically based? The right. uh, great thing with Sketchfab was that you know it was all kind of Unity based, and the materials were all set up in uh, a physically based kind of environment. So what you saw is what you get, but um, if I'm gonna to go to Turbo Squid and I'm gonna pay a thousand dollars on something, I wanna know if the polys are popping. I wanna know whether or not this guy had the geometry on the inside of the car modeled. I wanna know if the underside of the car has geometry and it's got detail. 
Um, you can see in here this card does not have any of that stuff. Or maybe it does. Hold on a second. Nope. This is glass. <laughs> it's very cool, though. But um, very cool. The idea behind that is just to like it does really interesting exposure uh, effects. Like when you go into the side, it, it actually changes the exposure on the camera. See how this all darkens in now? Oh, that, so, ba so so basically, it's like it's like auto exposure on 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 your cell phone camera. Yeah, almost. Or or, or any it's camera. It's how this animates. Or video cameras. Everything's got this auto exposure, where it just it automatically adjusts the lighting accordingly. Right. Well, your eyes naturally do that, and um, it'd yeah. be really great if we had um, exposure in Lightwave. Uh, instead of a post-processing plugin, it was actually done in camera. Oh, this is just um, awesome. Yeah, but uh, this is, you know, where things are going. And um, Lightwave is wonderfully suited to do this kind of work because it forces people, it forces artists to be clean about building their models, be efficient with building their stuff. And, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll take that challenge any day. I bet we can build more efficient, cleaner models than any other modelers on the planet, including Moto users. Um, because we've always had the problem of how many polys can we push and you know how much can uh, modeler move around and all that jazz and we don't get sloppy about it because we're forced to work on stuff and that's you know extremely high geometry but we've got to be efficient about where it is so that if it shows up in camera it's worth it and I just had this discussion with regards to the Iron Sky stuff a little while ago well I'm, I'm gonna and I'm gonna show you some things when when you're done we're, we're gonna take a 15 minute break after you and then we're gonna I'll come back I've been doing 3D 3D um, printing, as you know, yeah. and, I, and it, it, yeah. it really taught me the importance of being a damn good modeler. You know, no, oh, yeah. no, like, no, no, because, no you know, bullshit. One of these programs will always right. fall apart if you have crappy geometry. That's right. The reason why Turbo Squid mostly sucks is because all these you know, Max and Maya modelers are either clueless, they can't see what's wrong with the model when they go to render it because right. their renderers are you know, extremely forgiving, Right. Um, which is why they're probably extremely slow. Um, and you know either they just don't care um you know you'll have you know points on top of points that don't exist and other you know slop and some of that comes through conversion but not much of it um not as much as people think a lot of that stuff is just because the model is just lazy and sloppy and i see mm -hmm. horrific lightwave work you know i'm probably guilty of it myself at times but um you know merging points when they need to be merged making sure you have unified polys mm -hmm. uh, making sure there's no ingons tripling uh making sure that there's no uh, you know uh, non planar shit. Non planar you know, stuff going. <laughs> that kind of stuff that really no two makes point, a difference. No two point and, or uh, one point polys anywhere. <laughs> Straight well, points. That. So this is this is a brilliant um, uh, solution for somebody who wants to ship something around. Like let's say you're modeling a car. You can get a car into this thing easily. And you know, this is low poly I guess because hey, what do most people do in CAD anyways? They deal with low poly stuff. They don't need no, to be I'm looking. I'm looking like, at the edge of the glass. With, look at the, look like at the, If you go back, go look at the edge of the glass. See the see the glass wall there, the top edge. The ref, the yep. um the refraction that's going on in there is beautiful. Look at that. Yeah. It's beautiful. Works, works look at really that refraction. Well. Works really um, well. You know, whoever wrote this ray tracer is you know, brilliant. Yeah. Um, you know, again, this is just something that's pushing uh, minimal geometry, but the textures look great. Yeah, they look great. You, know, um, like you can see them go to a. Do what they're doing there. You, you can see it. You can see it go to a low resolution mode as you're moving, and then the minute you stop, it just resolves. Yeah, it look resolves. at that. It you just know, resolves. This is a little bit glossy. But That's too glossy. You know, yeah, definitely too glossy. Yeah. Take the glossy. Well, I don't know um, much about the material editor for this, but um, uh, it's it's all there. It's in the trial. It's in the demo. But you'll probably have to you know, download SketchUp or something. Uh, if somebody knows of a BIM uh, file exporter for. Lightwave, that'd be really great, or some way to convert um, Lightwave objects to BIM format. Right. Um, again, please let me know. But uh, uh, Pete is looking to you know, try to introduce this to Lightwave community because he's in the uh, sales and support area. So uh, let's do him a favor because he's a Lightwave artist, and uh, let's make him you know, um, famous at his company for bringing all these new customers to it and all these new users who are pushing this uh, in the Lightwave community so that we're not always staring at this nonsense. Okay, you know what I'm talking about? Right. I'm sick of seeing this. this yeah. This. And then no lightweight support. And then no lightweight support. Okay, I'm sick of it. Um, you know, somebody needs to call up the algorithm guys and say, what the hell? Um, we did get a little bit of a win there uh, a while back from 2018. did come out uh, with um, RealFlow being supported now for 2018, um, where they canceled it in 2015. 
So but we need more of this and we need to see those logos. That's the part of a problem with Lightwave's marketing is the visibility of that logo. What is Lightwave? Right. Oh, what's Lightwave? It's still around? You know, yeah, what's Lightwave? Yeah. You know, anytime it's, it's about visibility, it's about optics. And, um, you know, it's our job, uh, even though new tech marketing should be in there. Um, let's, let's, let's face it. It's, um, a daunting job. Uh, that's why a certain somebody was hired to fix and didn't do it. Um, but you know, it's always been that the users of this software have sold it the best because we're legit and there's no marketing hoopla involved in it. Um, but we need to get back into the game and start kicking ass because we know we can. And we have demonstrated it time and time again for the last 28 years of Lightwave's existence um, that this is the software that uh, one person can get their hands on and just do amazing work. That's right. I and, agree. You, know, you, can, you can see it at every step and point throughout the history of computer graphics on television. Uh, you can see it throughout the history of film uh, for the last 30 years. Uh, you can see it in games. Um, a lot of people are not uh, talking too much about it in games yet, but, you know, um, it was Chilton that was working with the Unity guys back when they were doing 1.0 to make sure that all their stuff loaded very directly into Unity yeah. and it was all one for one yeah, scale my, and it all just worked. My, my book where I needed to test my models, um, actually no, I think I, some of those went into Lightwave to test them out to go right into Unity because I have my, the app that I have that's associated with my book, right. um, that was, was all done in Unity. So, but, yeah. but of course the models, and in this case the models were done, the models were done in, in Photoshop. Photoshop's 3D um, engine, and then I, you know, I tested those models out in Lightwave, brought them into Unity. Um, yeah, it's all, it's starting to become, the market is starting to become interconnected, the whole, the whole 3D, yeah. con, the whole 3D scene. Um, it's getting yeah. to the point where it doesn't matter what you model it in, obviously Lightwave, I think it's a much better modeler than anything out there, um, but, um, but, now it's getting to the point where everything's starting to become interconnected. Now, now it comes yeah. down to efficiency and workflow, um, speed. Yeah. And I have not. Found and you know what? We already have an advantage there because yeah. lightwave modelers are very efficient. Yeah, they're really efficient. Okay? They don't very screw efficient. around. No, they that's don't. That's because the software was so-called crippled compared to these. You know, oh, let's use um, a hundred thousand polys to model a box kind of mentality from the three three C Max world. Yeah. Which is still the mentality. So. Um, so Danny Kenobi says he uses real flow and he was nervous that uh, that would not support 2018. No, it does. Um, they made that announcement um, a little while ago. Um, they've kind of gotten away from the render kit stuff. Um, but I believe the reason why they went back into it is because of the PBR uh, engine and just the fact that the geometry engine only 2018 has been improved to the point where, you know, you can actually start to see this stuff play back. All the options sequencer stuff, um, just because of the nature of it, right. um, the object sequencer really should have the option like what we had with um, Dennis's MDDs and the MDD loaders for right. like, natively, uh, where you can cache the object yeah. and keep as many frames as you can physically hold in memory. Um, that would improve things because you know, even TFD is loading that stuff off of disk as you scrub through. Right. So it doesn't cache that stuff. Um, you know, I have 32 gigs of RAM. Um, I'm not going to obviously store all the engine that I just showed in the earlier part of this demo in memory but the thing is I could store maybe 50, 100 frames of something okay. similar okay. and just being able to scrub through it and seeing that you know, being able to move around and not have it reload that stuff right. um, whenever I touch the timeline right. would be great um, and uh, you know that's only going to come if we continue to push and we continue to work with developers and we support them um, the, the key to Lightweave's success has always been third party okay working with its users. Yeah. So uh, support your third party people um, and uh, they will support you and make sure that um, uh, you've got uh, uh, yourself upgraded to the latest versions of your stuff. And you, if you can, I know sometimes it's uh, difficult financially, um, make sure that you're working with the latest versions of Lightwave. Uh, there are a lot of people that didn't upgrade, but there are a whole lot of people that hadn't upgraded in a long time that did. Right. And uh, I have it on good authority that Lightwave's had its best quarter in close to a decade. Good. With its release in 2018. So very, um, very good. That's yeah. All right. So I think about now we should take a 15 minute break. <laughs> yeah, go on. So you so got me all worked up and emotional. And like, oh, that's all right. Kick ass. <laughs> so no, you kick can, ass. so so do me a favor. Stick around and and stay connected mm -hmm. to um, Adobe Connect. 
And then what I'll do is I'll come back and share something. Now, now, Light Wiki, you were there, so I gave you the link. So you, you come on to the Adobe Connect. That's how we do it. Now, you mentioned something about um, Skype, but we don't do Skype this way. Now, not, not through this um, um, presentation. So, no, it, it's just a cluster screw. Yeah, it is. So, so we go through Adobe Connect. I gave you the link, so come on board if you want to present. Um, all right, so for now, what I'm going to do now, if you do me a favor, um, stop sharing your screen. Oh, read your Skype. Read your Skype. Right. Oh, is he telling That's me to read saying. my Skype? Oh, yeah. well, oh, hold on a second. Let me go bring it up real quick. Let me see what he has Slacker. to say. So why are you, well, now, why are you asking me to read the Skype? You're right here on the Adobe, right here on the, on Twitch. Because it's a private, because it's a private message. Oh, fine. It must be something important. All right, Hopefully let's see. Let me bring it up. Okay, so Skype's on the, on the opposite screen. And online render, once cats stop talking. <laughs> uh -oh. Jeez. <laughs> okay, so he says, go to a break with an exclamation point, by the way. Actually, hold on one second. Let me, let me, uh, everybody needs to see my expression on this one here. All right, here we go. Hold on, give me, give me a hot second. All yeah, right, just minutes. turn that off and uh, turn on my image. Yeah, let me uh, stop sharing the screen. All right. Image. And again, for any other information, that's Enscape 3D. Right. Okay. The there we go. Here. We're back. Okay. Um, hey, let me go, go back and get my little Skype. Where are you? Skype, right? That's not Skype. Oh, that's kind of bizarre. Oh, here it's right in front of me. Okay, good. All right. So, um, like Wiki says, um, go to a break! Exclamation point. Um, Fifteen minutes. In fact, let me try something. Um, he gave Did you me have a. Timer? What was that? Well, yeah, no, well, we haven't brought it up yet. We're not on the break yet. I just wanted to kind of read this off before we go to break. So, mm -hmm. join that. Okay. Once cats cat has stopped talking, um, then that's it. All right. So here we go. So. Um, right. Let's see, did I put, let me see if I still have it here. All right, good. So I'm going to put into Skype here just for you, uh, like Wiki. Um, just so that's the link. You're going to, go, you're going to join us now. Now we're going to go to break. Um, and then when we go to break, I'm going to, you know, mute the microphone. Mm -hmm. um, but um, here, let me go to, there we go, the, the, the 15 minute timer. Yes, he is. Yeah. Yeah, he's maximized. Okay, here we go. We're on break now. All right, cool. All so, right. Um, all right, very good. So, I'm going to stop recording. So, remind me to record. Stop recording.